He shared about refreshing, and it changed the whole atmosphere. And so the volume increased. I started to hear laughter. People were smiling. Thought we were going to have to get an usher over here on aisle four. Uh, Neil and Linda started cutting up. And, and so, so we shared about refreshing, and then we prayed for refreshing. So you should have a double portion of refreshing already. All right? And so I just want you to know, turn with me in your Bibles, if you would, to, to Philemon. Uh, how many of you thought... Uh, several weeks ago when we started this, that uh, a whole book of the Bible or a letter of the Bible that doesn't even fill up one page, that we could spend this much time and get this much good stuff out of a handwritten note, all right? And so we're going to spend several more weeks on it, but tonight I want to talk about that. Sunday morning we were talking about uh, sharing our faith and, and from verse 6 of Philemon where uh, Paul encourages Philemon to be active in sharing his faith so that he can have a full knowledge of all the good things we have in Christ. And so he goes on to say that one of the blessings of their relationship was that he understood, he drew great joy and comfort from the fact that Philemon had often refreshed the hearts of the saints. And then later in, the, in verse 20, I think it is, then Paul asks Philemon, refresh my heart as well, brother. All right? And so here's the whole principle of sowing and reaping. That it's in effect that Paul takes the time to point out the things in Philemon that are not only refreshing to other people, but were refreshing to him. And then at the end, he asks, after he ministers life to him and encouragement and, and refreshing, then he says, now I need to be refreshed in you. And, and what he was asking him was to do the right thing, to do the hard thing, to do the godly thing, to receive Onesimus back into his house, not just as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother in the Lord. Right? And so the whole dynamic there of, of a relationship with Christ changed everything, not only for Paul and Paul to Onesimus, but Paul and Onesimus back to Philemon, and eventually the whole church at Colossae. And Paul mentioned several other people who were involved with that. Epaphras was uh, the man, uh, I believe, and many others believe, who founded the church there. And Paul mentions him and says, Epaphras, who is one of you, is always wrestling in prayer for you. How many of you, it's just refreshing when you know somebody's really digging in and praying for you. And, and so Paul starts this letter here uh, with various ways of identifying specific things that Philemon does or is, character qualities, that Paul says, these things just bless me. That they refresh me. This is who you are. And, and this is just oozing with love and uh, a depth of relationship that Paul doesn't even have to define, but using the words that he does just brings it home all the more powerfully. And so here are two men that had a great relationship, but it, it had gotten strained. And so Paul is having to write this note back to him to ask him to do something very difficult and ask him to forgive uh, ask him to overcome uh, stuff that would undoubtedly be in his heart. Uh, if Philemon had, or Onesimus had stolen or damaged anything, uh, Paul said, I'm writing this with my own hand. I will repay it, put it on my account. And so there's obviously more than just the fact that, you know, these guys that, that uh, Onesimus used to uh, work for Philemon, if you will. It was far worse than that. He was a slave. And so, even in that whole dynamic, which we're going to talk about uh, Sunday night as we address some of those things in our conversation, but the way in which Paul addresses it opens the door for healing and reconciliation in such an incredible way. And so I want us to look at that tonight just from the standpoint of refreshing. What, what not only refreshes you, but if we're going to minister and be effective in changing people's lives and opening their hearts even in difficult circumstances or situations, 
that manipulation doesn't get it. Paul later says, look, I could be bold and command you to do this. How many know that that really doesn't work either? Uh, Just commanding somebody to do something, even if it's the right thing to do, doesn't open their heart many times. It closes the door. And so here, Paul defines it for us in such a powerful way. And he gives him uh, these specific things. There are five specific things that I want to point out that he compliments him on. But before that, uh, I want to just get some interaction from you. In, In your group, doesn't have to be what you shared necessarily, but what what was one thing that stood out to you that somebody shared uh, in the various groups about what refreshed you? Just throw some out to me. Rest refreshes you. You know, the Bible says that too. That's why God gave us the Sabbath. And rest is the only one. And you're all going to have some rest right now. Love and smile. Hugs and smile. Come on. Yeah, because they were looking at Miss Gail the hugger. Amen. And a smiler. Isn't that great? Simple things that refresh us. Rest. Hugs. Smiles. What else? Vacation. Come on. Yes, I'm going to start tomorrow. What what was the other one? I'm sorry. Kindness. Isn't kindness refreshing? You ought to just be nice to one another. Even before you leave tonight. That would be great. Come on, what are some others? Hot shower. (laughs) Or... A cold shower if you live in South Mississippi in the humidity. All right? A couple more. Family gatherings can be refreshing. Or they can be a study in weirdness, right? (laughs) Just depends on who shows up, doesn't it? All right? Others? Did you say, Bill? Fellowship. Amen. Awesome. All right, well, I I took some time this afternoon as I went down that trail to to look up specific things that Scripture says. And you touched on some of those. Uh, One of the first things it says is to have a meal, to share this meal together that you might eat and be refreshed. You may find that a refreshing thing. Uh, And especially if it's low carb, you know, so you don't have to take a nap afterwards. God said that He gave them a Sabbath rest so that their animals could rest and their servants could rest. God ordained and commanded the Sabbath so that we could have a rest. And then he says, so that your donkey and your servants may rest and be refreshed. Worship brings refreshing. Uh, 1 Samuel 16, when it's talking about uh, David worshiping before the Lord and uh, they would call him in when Saul was troubled by a demonic spirit, that when David would worship the Lord, that, that the spirit would leave Saul and he would be refreshed. Okay? And so worship brings refreshing. Praying in the spirit brings refreshing uh, and building us up. Uh, last night, Tuesday night, it was just refreshing for me to be over here in the prayer room uh, surrounded by people who were just walking around praying in the spirit. And, and it was just refreshing to be in that atmosphere Psalm 19 says the Word of God refreshes us and revives our soul. Uh, A faithful servant refreshes the heart of his master when he carries out the task with diligence. Repenting and turning to God brings refreshing from the presence of the Lord, Acts 3.19. People, as we mentioned, can bring refreshing. 1 Corinthians 16 uh, talks about three men that brought the offering uh, to Paul and were expressing their concern and, and uh, had followed through with not only concern, but uh, money that would meet a need uh, to them. And Paul says, not only mentions them by name and says that they refreshed his heart, but said such men are worthy uh, to be uh, uh, complimented. And then uh, he later says in 2 Corinthians that um, they blessed him Because when Titus came and they were so kind and received Titus with such love that it totally refreshed his heart. And Paul wasn't even in that crowd. He said, it it just blessed me to see how refreshed Titus was because of your fellowship. You know, and when you see that interaction with other people, uh, later uh, Paul mentions a young man by name, Onesiphorus. 
And in his letters to Timothy, he, he cites him and, and exalts him because he said, he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, he searched hard for me. And then when he found me, he said, he refreshed me, he blessed me, he poured into me. And of course, Paul would be writing that letter from prison. And, and you know, in the Roman prison system, it's not like you go to uh, cell block D, you know, number four. Um, many of them would be thrown in there together in a dungeon somewhere. And so when Paul said he looked hard for me, searched for me, he had to go through some pretty dark places to find him. And just the fact that he saw a familiar face, but somebody that was willing to be there to minister to him in his constraints and in a tough time brought refreshing to him. All right, and so great. Appreciate you participating with me tonight and, and just sharing on a practical level as well as from the spiritual dynamic. So I want us to look here just for a few minutes at, at what Paul says and points out uh, to Philemon about things that blessed and refreshed him. And he was refreshing uh, to Philemon before uh, he shared with him even the, the reason for his note and for his letter. And so I want to look at the first eight verses here tonight of the, the letter of Philemon, almost a fourth or a third, if you will, of this short letter is taken up with compliments, uh, character qualities, affirming uh, Philemon, his family, uh, who he is, what he does. And how many of you know, that's a refreshing thing when people point that out. So the first thing he says uh, after he just cites it, says, Paul, uh, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend. So we're just a few words into the note, and Paul is already affirming to Philemon, not the fact that he's a friend, or not just some generic label, hey buddy, but you're a dear friend. You know, friendship is a good thing. Having dear friends is incredibly refreshing. Can you say amen? And so he points out the fact that he's a dear friend. Now you think, well, what's the point with that? If you read this from the wrong spirit and the wrong perspective, uh, you could just say, you know, he's setting him up. Hey, you know, old buddy, old pal. And man, your wife's sure pretty and your family's sure blessed. And, you know, you go to a great church. Man, everything's just going great for you. You're a really great guy. Uh, oh, by the way, that's, that's not the spirit at all. And when you see it, he points out those things. And, and later when he says, the, the thing that blesses me, the thing that brings me joy, the thing that brings me comfort is that you always refresh the hearts of the saints, and that you love all of God's people. And so he said, not only does it bless me to see you do that, he didn't say that you've refreshed me, he said you refresh the hearts of all the saints. Okay? And so sometimes it's what we do for other people. Other times it's the connection that, that we have with somebody. And then as that friendship grows over time and years, and, and you realize you know, who your friends are. In, in tough times, and then you realize the friends that are going to go above and beyond. And it's not some cutesy little BFF, my bre best friend forever on Facebook, because that changes, you know, from week to week from what I see. But, but it's the real friends that, that stick through you in the tough times, stick to you and help you make it through the tough times. Can you say amen? All right, uh, Proverbs says, Proverbs seventeen seventeen, a friend loves at all times... And a brother is born for adversity. A friend loves at all times. Good times, bad times, uh, miserable times, when, when you get the award uh, and, and when there's no uh, trophy for what you just did. When, when you're walking in, in, in at your best and when you're at your worst. A friend loves at all times. Okay? And that love breaks through those things. To me, the, the highest level of relationship, it, it's just incredible that Jesus brought his disciples to was not servanthood, was not leadership, was not power, was not uh, blessing them with um, uh, the ability to do what he did. But he said, 
I no longer call you servants, but friends. Friendship was the highest level of relationship for Jesus. Listen, if it was the highest level of relationship with Jesus, what should it mean to us? But, but see, our culture, uh, and if we're not careful, we embrace that. It, 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 who, in uh, relationships, you remember uh, back in high school, uh, when, you're, when you're dating somebody and you're kind of interested in them, but then you're not interested anymore, but they might still be interested in you and that, that kind of awkward deal. And then you say, who, who is this? Is this, you know, your girlfriend or whatever? No, that's just my friend. Like it's a lower level than, you know, oh, oh it's my girlfriend, it's my boyfriend, it's my whatever kind of friend. It's just a friend. There, it, spiritually, there's no such thing as just a friend. Okay? That, that it reverses the, the grade and friendship is the highest level, not some, oh yeah, it's, it's just a friend. And to me, it's just telling of our culture and our view of relationships and how they've been skewed. Because we, when we're self-centered, it, it's what other people can do for us. But true friendship isn't just what somebody else can do for us. It's what we can do for them when they can't do something for themselves. It's what we can be for them. It's when we can defend them when they're not even there. When, when we can stand up for them when they can't even stand. Okay? Love covers a multitude of sin. And if a brother's born for adversity and a friend loves at all times, sometimes when we're needed the most is when we want to be there the least. And love compels us and friendship draws us to the hurting and the broken and the ugly parts in people rather than who we can hang out with and who we can be seen with and who's on our friend list. Okay? That, that here Paul writes to Philemon and he says that the foremost thing on his mind was that he was writing this note to a dear friend and carries that tone all the way through. When he gets to verse 8, then he eventually says, Therefore, uh, I have a favor to ask you as a friend. But he, he starts with, you're my dear friend. Second thing that he points out to him isn't that he's just a dear friend, but he's a fellow worker. You know, it's one thing to have a friend. It's refreshing to have friends who just uh, speak the truth, who are there for you, who see things with a different perspective that... You know, you, you don't, uh, you can let your guard down. You can just be real. Okay, you can have a conversation and not worry about it being misunderstood or misinterpreted or questioning you or any of that. that that's great. But it's also refreshing to have folks that are going to come alongside you and help carry the load. I mean, dear friends are only complimented by fellow workers. And, and here's one and the same. So he's pointing out a whole different aspect here. Not only are you a dear friend, but you're a fellow worker. I don't know how many of you saw the commercial on television. I don't even know what it's for, but I think it's a satellite deal or something. But one guy is there and he's moving his stuff and his friend comes over. His friend comes over and he's like, oh man, I just want to hang out with you for a while before you leave. And he said, do you want to help me? Oh no, I'm good. And he sits down on the couch that the guy's trying to load and has this conversation with it. Okay? We don't need friends like that. So sometimes, you know, you don't need your friends there. You need the dear friends who are going to be fellow workers. You know, we can talk later. There's a shovel. You know, we can talk later. Can you help me do this? And, and it's refreshing to have people come alongside and help carry the load. Can you say amen? All right? So Paul knew what it was like to work hard. In fact, he pointed that out in some of his letters. Look, we weren't lazy. We worked hard while we were among you. A and then we would finish our day jobs, tent making or whatever it was, and then we would preach the gospel at night so that we wouldn't be a burden to any of you. So when Paul points out to Philemon, not only are you a dear friend, but you're a fellow worker, it meant something totally different to Paul than it might have to other people. It wasn't just the fact that Oh, you, you're a minister too. Now, when Paul said, you're a fellow worker, he knew what work was all about. Y y do you have people in your life that, that know how to work? Yeah, they're on your top of your list when you've got a job to do. 
All right, not to take advantage of, but you know, look, man, I, uh, sometimes you want to fellowship and hang out, and, and whether the job gets done or not is beside the point. You just have a great time being there. Other times, look, we're in a crisis. We're in a crunch. We need to get this done. I need some help. I need some expertise. I know somebody that's going to be there. And what you need is a friend who's also a fellow worker. And man, it just not only makes the job a whole lot better, but you accomplish a whole lot more. Two are better than one, Ecclesiastes says, for they get a better return for their reward. And, and a cord of three strands is not easily broken. And so what Paul's doing here with Philemon is these compliments and uh, he's refreshing his heart because he's got something that he needs to ask him that, that he, he's going to come back to and say, look, I need you to refresh my heart. But sowing and reaping is a powerful deal. You can't reap in a field you haven't sown in. And so Paul is sowing genuine compliments and pointing out characteristics in Philemon's life that genuinely bless him. And, and he's complimenting him on them. And so he talks about a dear friend. Everybody say dear friend. He, he talks about a fellow worker. Say a fellow worker. Then the fact that he's a family man. All these are appropriate uh, uses of the F word, by the way. A uh, uh, friend, a uh, fellow worker, family man. We should use those a lot more than our culture does uh, defining that term, all right? And he, and he points out the fact that not only am I greeting you, a dear friend and fellow worker, but I'm also greeting your wife, who's our sister, Apphia. And then he says, your son, Archippus, who's a fellow soldier. A fellow soldier. Right? And he doesn't give uh, Philemon that direct compliment. But how many of you know the indirect compliments and, and the, the compliments that people pay your kids reflect back on you? All right? And so here he says, he compliments him for being a family man and blesses his family, his wife, his son, mentions them by name. Right? When, when I talk to people and they go down through the list, uh, it's usually dear friends who care a whole lot less about what I say and how I'm doing, uh, but they want to know how Kim's doing, how the kids are doing, how the grandkids are doing, and, and they go down through this list, and, you know, with our family growing to the size it is, that's a long conversation in itself. See, but how many of you know, just that sense of someone genuinely caring for you means that they care about those closest to you. And the, 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 a blessed family is the fruit of a faithful life. And so when Paul mentions his family by name, that's a blessing to uh, Philemon as well and, and would be a, a, certainly a point of pride. The Scripture says that the generous man would be blessed and his children after him uh, would be blessed as well. And, and so in that sense, here he's being not only generous with his praise and his compliment, but affirming uh, that Philemon was a, a good family man as well, which leads us into the, the fourth thing here, that he compliments his son as being a fellow soldier. Uh, uh, another way to say that was, man, that boy of yours is a real trooper. Th that son of yours, man, he's fighting with us. And we appreciate that. He's right alongside us. He's there. And, and it's a direct result of what, uh, he had seen, obviously, in his dad's life. Then the fifth thing that he points out, fourth thing uh, in particular about Philemon is in verse 5, where he calls him a faithful follower of Christ. And he describes that. Here he says in, in verse 5 uh, or 4, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers, because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. Then he encourages him, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Verse 7, look at this. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. Notice he didn't say, here's what you've done for me. Paul spends almost a third of this note just affirming 
who Philemon is. Who he is as a man, who he is as a follower of Christ, who he is as a husband and a family man, who he is as a fellow worker. And it's not to butter him up, it's to establish that sense of refreshing to his heart. We talk about the ripple effect. What, what goes out from him would have just blessed Philemon in hearing it. I mean, be honest, not in a prideful kind of way, but don't you appreciate it when people genuinely compliment you and they don't have to? And, and the fact that they would, that here, obviously, they didn't have email and he couldn't text him. So he writes a handwritten note, but he sends it back with Onesimus, the one he had the issue with. But his, his note was not just, okay, here's the deal. Onesimus told me the way you treated him. And buddy, I got a bone to pick with you. And the Bible says we're supposed to be kind to people. And so I'm telling you right now, all right, that wouldn't have changed anything. It would have hardened his heart and, and that whole dynamic. So he doesn't do that. Here, you can, you can just feel the sense that when Paul leads Onesimus to the Lord and then begins to find out the ripple effect in his life, why was he there? How did they connect? We're not told. He just said that he became my son in the faith while I was in prison. And I became a father to him. That's Paul's way of saying that he led him to Christ. So here he leads this runaway slave to faith in Christ. And it's like, oh great, now it creates another ripple. Now what are we going to do? Now there's going to have to be some reconciliation here and how are we going to go about it? And you could tell, Paul didn't just waste his time pacing around a, 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 a prison cell, praying in the Spirit for God to get those guys that put him in there. That, that he was, he had a picture of Philemon right there before him. He could see his eyes, he could see his face, he could see his expression, he, he could remember what they'd walked through together. He thought about uh, the church that was in his house and how the thing was laid out and the reports that he'd gotten from him and the men that surrounded him. And so here he starts off, and instead of cutting directly to the chase, he, he talks about his heart, talks about his faith, talks about his love for all people, talks about his heart for God, talks about his faithfulness, talks about how those qualities are being reproduced in his son and how he sees it reflected in his wife. And then he comes to the point, therefore, this, I said all that to say, okay, then he comes to, therefore, though I could be very bold and command you to do what is right. You know, there is a right and wrong here. But there's a higher law that Paul employs. And that's the law of love. And we could talk about love from different perspectives. You know, we, we, I think it was Dr. Dobson that wrote the book called Tough Love. And, and that's a form of love, and it's effective, and it's powerful, and it's good. But I like refreshing love better. How about you? I'm, I'm serious. There, there's a time when we need to employ it. There's a time when we need to man up and look somebody in the eye and say, okay, bro, that's enough. Stop it. And Paul could do that. R read Corinthians. Okay, when he needed to drop the hammer, he could drop the hammer but here he chose to drop a rock and to create a ripple and, and it was love in Christ. And so he said, I, I, this isn't a command. This is an appeal to you based on the love we share. You can just hear the, the sigh. You know, it's kind of like one of those deals where you get the note, you know, and you open it up and you're kind of holding your breath and this is just, hey, Dear brother, you're a friend of mine. Not only that, you're a fellow worker. I'm glad you're on my team. Not only that, I appreciate your family and I love them. And I see that your son is a fellow soldier just like you. And I see that you've got a faith toward Christ that's exemplary. And I just want to point that out. Now here's my issue. I have a favor to ask you. 
but I'm not asking out of a boldness of command. I'm asking friend to friend. Fellow worker to fellow worker. Man to man. Brother in Christ to brother in Christ. And here's another brother that needs to be included in that. He's my heart. He's my life. I don't want to send him back. I wanted to keep him. But I needed him to be a mailman. I needed him to deliver this appeal to you from my heart. And then after he goes through the issues, he said, so now, brother, refresh my heart in Christ. You see the dynamic? How different is that going to be if Paul just lays into him? Paul is the same guy that, that defined love so vividly for us in 1 Corinthians 13. And he started that chapter by saying, And now I will show you the most excellent way. And he goes through talking about all the different expressions that, man, I could uh, prophesy, I could do all kinds of things, but if I don't have love, I'm just making a bunch of noise. So he didn't write this note to rock the boat. He wrote this note to Philemon to create a ripple effect, to, to drop a huge boulder of love in the middle of this murky water and let the ripple go out from there. I think it's verse 8 uh, as you know, 1 Corinthians 13. Then Paul said that, that love uh, never fails. But before that, he said, love, uh, I'll show you the most excellent way. Love always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Love never fails. I want you to think just for a moment tonight about that. Here's, here's the qualities, again, that Paul points out to Philemon. You're a dear friend. I want you to think tonight, if you were in trouble... If you were desperate, who would you call? Let me say it another way. If you show me who your friends are, I'll show you what your future is going to look like. The, the, the friends are not just associates and people that hang around us. Dear friends are people we share our hearts with and our lives with. Who is that for you? And the reason that's important is because Paul not only addresses this letter to Philemon, but he says, you're the one I'm praying for. And I believe that Paul prayed on a different level for Philemon because he was a dear friend than he did for other people. I know God doesn't play favorites, or so we say, uh, but yet he does. God doesn't love everybody the same. God loves people who need it the most, the most. And God, the love doesn't change. The need changes. All right, so when we understand that and we express it, how does that affect our life? How does that affect our prayer life? How does that affect our dynamics and relationships? See, because there's, there's just a different level of grace for dear friends, not less than, greater than. Because you understand them. There, there's grace. Friends can say things that are offensive and it's not offending. It, it doesn't offend us because we know their heart. That's why Paul says in verse 3, grace and peace to you from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Very common greeting. But it, it, and again, the interesting thing, it's the Greek and the Hebrew blessing combined. Grace, God's dynamic power at work in the hearts of men by the Holy Spirit. Not, not just His favor, undeserved favor, but charis, the grace. It's where we get uh, charismatic, the grace gifts. They're all empowered by grace. So He said grace, which is the Greek, and shalom, 
peace, which is the Hebrew. And, and he combines them. There's a Greek word for peace as well. But the, the emphasis Paul's bringing here is, listen, we're taking both worlds, both cultures, bringing them together, and I'm speaking to you grace and peace. And I'm focusing it on you, a dear friend. Okay? So who are your friends? If you had a job to do, a task to do that was bigger than yourself, who would you call? If you need, not just, I mean, it could be something, whatever. If you couldn't get to something at your house or you needed somebody to mow your grass or you needed somebody to come do something for you, who would you call? Hey, um, you could call a service or you could call whatever. You could go through the phone book and you could go through whatever and find somebody who could do the task, but there wouldn't be a level of trust. There, there wouldn't be near as much as an openness. Are you with me here? All right, so, so when Paul's writing this note and he's writing at that level of compassion and concern to Philemon, the reason he points it out is because he's just opening his heart. He's pouring refreshing on him because he's going to need refreshing back to know that not only is he going to do what he asks of him, because of their love, he's going to do more than he asks. He's going to go beyond the limit. And that's what love does. All right? When we understand that, who's our friends? Who's, who are the fellow workers that we would call, people that we would trust, not just with the task, but to know our heart and how we want it done and come alongside us? Okay? When you get burdened, who would you call to help carry the load? Okay? That, that's a dear friend, fellow worker combined. Okay? What about our family? The, the, the focus of that, the emphasis of that. What do we want that to be? What do we want people to say about our families? And so we have the power to influence that. The, the ripple effect goes to them because when they go out, they're an extension of who we are. Okay? I, I'm, I'm just blessed to, to have children uh, who are fellow soldiers. You know, and the, the compliment of that, not just because Ethan works here or whatever in the male sense, but in that. But it's just as much of a blessing to have people speak into their lives, maybe not in that exact term, but to, to talk about who they are. It's an extension. It's a blessing. It's the grace and the peace that God's brought that, that's extended out. Amen? And then just those who are there, who are faithful in Christ, Every one of those things that Paul points out to Philemon are things that refresh me in other people. How about you? That, that character qualities that I see or things that I see that, man, it just blesses me. And, and there's a blessing that comes along with it, not just because Paul spoke it. He just emphasized what was already there. Okay? That, that Philemon was walking in that level of blessing because of God's grace. And that he could say things and, and emphasize what was about to come. Therefore, I'm making an appeal to you. I'm asking a huge favor of a dear friend and not feel uh, put out by it, not feel burdened by it because of the peace that's there. Okay? The peace is total well-being in God. That, that he just surrounds us, he comforts us, and then moves us forward into that. And so tonight, I, I was just blessed today, thinking and looking back. When we're talking about sharing our faith with people, and from Sunday morning we talked about that we need to be refreshing, not condemning. And so it's one thing to say that in a general term. You know, boy, Paul was refreshing, not condemning. Or you need to be refreshing. That's why I asked you at the beginning, what refreshes you? Because... What Paul needed was what he pointed out in Philemon. Before he asked to be refreshed by him, and before he said it in those terms, refresh my heart, brother, by doing the right thing. And I know you will. He didn't start there. He did it all the way at the end of the note. And he sowed the refreshing. He spoke the refreshing, the blessing, into, Paul's life, or into Philemon's life before he ever asked for it in return, before he asked for anything. He said, this refreshes me. Now, he had some points where he could have condemned him. 
for the way he treated people. People aren't property. I, I don't understand how God hasn't convicted you of owning slaves yet. I mean, there's a, there's a strong tone that he could have brought. Are you seeing it? But love is even greater than that. Because love never fails. And along with it is a tremendous refreshing. And so then Paul could ask him or make the, the demand, if you will, the obligation, refresh my heart as well. You've refreshed the hearts of the saints. You've shown your love for them, for all people. Now, show your love for me. Refresh my heart as well. And I know that you'll not just do this, you'll do more than I ask. How awesome is that? That's the kind of person that I want to be. And those are the kind of people that I want to be surrounded with. And I appreciate the fact that so many of you are those people. Let's pray together. Father, I just thank you tonight for our time of refreshing here and just ministering that to each of us by the Spirit. Father, I realize that there were distinct moments and times where you administer that in different ways to people. So we heard it in the laughter. We, we sensed it in the worship, the closeness of your presence, your power, your life ministering to us. Fathers, we took a posture of worship or kneeling before you, expressing that to you from our hearts. Lord, worship brings a deep refreshing. Worship changes that whole dynamic in our lives. As we looked at the Word and saw this clear picture, Lord, of what a refreshing this relationship was both ways. How a very difficult circumstance turned out to be a tremendous blessing and brought refreshing to so many people. Undoubtedly, people had taken sides. Some of them were totally understanding of Onesimus and some of them were concerned for Philemon and some of them were caught up in the law and some of those were family members. Some of those were church folks. But Lord, you brought it down to a conclusion that everybody's heart could be refreshed. Everybody's life could be blessed for what they saw. So Lord, we thank you for it tonight. We thank you for, the, for that example and the demonstration of what it is just to be a person who brings refreshing to others in their life. Lord, I pray that each of us would purpose in our hearts to do that, to be those kind of people in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody who agreed said, amen, amen. Hey, I want some of you, if you would, uh, if you want to receive prayer uh, tonight, Bill, if a couple of you could uh, just stay down here with me. If not, we can be dismissed, but just remind everybody, if you didn't pick up a, uh, card from Sunday or you haven't turned that in yet, if you do so tonight, you can either put them in the box back there or hand them to Pastor Chris. There's some extra cards back there by the offering box and uh, you could get those or you could go to the website and uh, we set up a way that you could just uh, submit questions and experiences online. And uh, so I'm meeting with Pastor Anthony in the morning and they're excited about it and we're making some plans. So we're going to have a great time. Uh, Sunday night at 6, and uh, if you can be here Sunday morning, that would be a blessing as well. Amen? God bless you in the Lord. Be refreshed, made fresh all over again. Amen.